Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I am Miss Angler, and in today's video, we are going to look at other mechanisms of evolution. And if you haven't watched the videos on natural selection, you should click the link above now. Or if you haven't watched any of the videos on the introduction to evolution, as well as Lamarckism, I've linked the videos above as well as in the description below. You should watch those first before you watch this video. Now, if you are new here, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and make sure you are subscribed with your notifications turned on because I post every Tuesday and Thursday. And if you are in matric and you're looking to get that extra edge for your exams, you should think about joining my membership. That membership gives you access to my free study guide as well as many other perks like live lessons and extra exam preparation videos. Now, as we get into the video, we're going to look at the final component of evolution and the mechanisms that drive evolution, or in other words, these are things that cause evolution to occur. Now, the list that we're going to look at now doesn't necessarily mean that they are linked to the chances of survival. Up until now, we've spoken about being able to survive. Natural selection is about surviving and reproducing. Sometimes, however, nature steps in and something randomly occurs, a natural disaster, or um, there might be an avalanche and something separates the population from each other. And we end up having a change occur that had nothing to do with the fact that they needed to improve their chances of surviving, but rather they were just separated from one another and therefore they couldn't reproduce with each other. And if a change occurred, it couldn't be spread amongst the wider population. Now, these other mechanisms are grouped into three, and we're going to go through all of them. The first one being gene flow, which refers to how genes flow in and amongst a population and how distance or objects or barriers can prevent this from happening. The second one we're going to look at is genetic drift, and genetic drift is focusing in on natural disasters and how they affect um, evolution and how they have the potential to be a selecting force. And lastly, something called polyploidy. Polyploidy is essentially a way in which the chromosome number can change. Um, and this is often seen in plants more than it is in animals. But we'll look at how that affects the ability for a organism to survive by having extra chromosomes. Now, getting into the first mechanism, which is gene flow, and you may already be um, somewhat familiar with this idea of gene flow because it does actually come up in natural selection um, as well as speciation, which is the next video after this particular one, which I've linked now above as well if you want to go and watch that after this. But gene flow represents how genes flow within a population. In other words, organisms that live in a big population, how do they their genes mix with one another. Now, if a population lives in a fairly small area, it's really easy for their genes to mix with each other when they reproduce with each other. But the difficulty comes in is if they're over really large spaces like whole continents, and there might sometimes be barriers that appear. And a great example that I've used before is this one here with a deer population. And on the one side, we have population number one, and that is represented by the little red dots, and then population two. Now, you'll notice there are different colors. And how did we get to being a different colors? So let's assume that population number one on the left-hand side here was the original population, the Western deer population. They were this yellowy brown color, lighter tan color. And that was the main original population. And that was all their colors with maybe a few brown here or there, little few darker brown ones. And they were living in one particular location. And what they would do is they would uh, walk across this mountain range. And maybe they lived on one side of the mountain range in summertime and one side in the winter. And they went back and forth. But then something happened. A barrier that they could normally move around or through is now permanently closed. Let's imagine that this particular mountain range is now covered in snow or ice. They can't cross it anymore. And you end up with having two separate populations. So now what you have is population A on the one side of the barrier 
here is our barrier. And you have the other population A on the other side. And we're going to start off with them being the same populations. So it's almost like population one, population two. Both of them are still A's. In other words, they're the same color. But this barrier represents a reproduction barrier as well because deer can't climb this ice. They can't get around um, the barrier. And so they just end up reproducing with whoever's closest to them. And so over time, we end up with two populations that are different. We end up with our western deer being a lighter brown color and our eastern deer being a darker brown color. And you can see that in their alleles, just above represented by the red and blue circles, how frequent the color may be. Now, if hypothetically that ice that formed in between um, melts away, you still have population A on the one side. You now have population B on the other side. However, this is important, they are not different species. And so a key takeaway from this particular gene flow example is that they are still the same species. They're just different colors and therefore they can still interbreed with one another and produce fertile offspring. However, if we were to take the eastern and the western deers, bring them together, and they can't reproduce, then we know we have a new species. So please note, just because an organism's color has changed doesn't mean it's a new species. It could simply be a new variation of color that has arisen. And if we took away the ice that maybe might be on this mountain range and they mixed again, they would still be able to reproduce. The next component to our mechanisms of evolution is something called genetic drift. Now, genetic drift is an unusual one because this is linked to a natural disaster occurring where it doesn't matter if you can survive, the natural disaster takes out everybody, whether you have the advantage or not. And this can be linked to things like massive destructions, like tsunamis and volcano eruptions, where you can't really outrun the disaster. And so what we have here is an example of a population. Now, the bottle contains two different colors of, um, let's say, like marbles. And the parent population, this one over here, the original population, they are beginning off with a fairly even amount of blue and yellow individuals. That's the same species. It's just a population that are two different colors. And some kind of natural disaster occurs in the second stage yet. There's a drastic reduction. And we call that like a bottleneck event. And so imagine a huge tsunami wave comes, moves through an area, and it kills animals indiscriminately. It just means it kills them regardless of whether they have a, an advantage to survive or not. And what you're left with is a surviving group where perhaps one color is more prevalent than the other. In other words, there's more blue than there is yellow. Now, that doesn't mean that the blue were better at surviving. It doesn't necessarily mean that the blue had a better adaptations. It just meant by chance there were more blues surviving than yellows. It had nothing to do with their color. They then reproduce, and over time, in the next generation and generations after that, you somehow have more blue than you have yellow. And it has nothing to do with the fact that blue is more advantageous, that it is better for survival or reproduction. It's just because there were more blue than yellow, which means the frequency of blue is higher. So naturally, you're going to have more blue babies. And we know that, and we've learned that in the genetics, that that's how it can play out. What's not represented in this diagram, but I want you to imagine what it would look like, is that eventually what can happen is natural selection can step back in again, and it can allow the numbers of colors to go back to being even. In other words, yellow and blue become even again. And that might be because the adaptations they have require them to be blue and also yellow. And having too many blue might be a disadvantage in the population. But this is an example of genetic drift. Now, the final component to our mechanisms for evolution is something called polyploidy. You may have heard of it before, but it references the amount of chromosome sets. Um, and poly meaning more than or many. 
And basically what that means is normally we have cells in our bodies that are diploid. They have sets of chromosomes. As you can see, there's one set and there's another set. And inside your body, you can make gametes and those gametes are haploid and they only get one chromosome from each set. And that's normally how we experience this. But certain organisms, mostly plants, they can be triploid or tetraploid, which means that they can have extra sets of chromosomes, three, sometimes four sets of full chromosomes. Now, what this produces is um, organisms that have extra chromosomes, they have more genetic material, which means it affects how they grow. Now, in animals, it's often detrimental to be triploid or tetraploid. Um, and so you don't see it that often, but goldfish are one example of organisms that can do this. It's more frequently seen in plants. And I've just included this little picture here of strawberries because they're a perfect example of what humans do to um, fruit in order to make them bigger. What you see on the right-hand side, uh, the right-hand strawberry, this one over here, is a normal diploid strawberry. On the left-hand side is a tetraploid strawberry or a polyploid strawberry and that's why sometimes if you've ever eaten these like really big strawberries um, it looks like there's like more than one strawberry growing together and basically there is because you've got an extra set of DNA and that means that you can grow bigger and fuller and, and more um, and this is easy to do in plants but like I said that might be an advantage to plants for spreading their seeds and ensuring their survival but in animals this is not the case we don't want that it extra chromosomes often lead to syndromes and disorders now, as always, I like to finish off my lessons with a terminology a recap. First of all, we started off looking at gene flow. Remember, this was in reference to how genes flow between populations and keep everyone similar, maybe colors or sizes, but often the gene flow can be cut off and this then results in alleles not spreading through the population, but being um, like separate. And you often then get two separate populations with maybe different colors or different sizes, but they're still the same species. And eventually it can lead to a new species if the gene flow is cut off for long enough. Then we have something called genetic drift, which remember is when there was like a natural disaster. It doesn't matter if you're adapted or not. You just don't survive regardless of whether you can swim or fly away. It just means that you have no adaptations that can help you. And so nature with its natural selection um, can't help you. And instead, um, this natural disaster has happened and it wipes out individuals and whoever's left behind is left to reproduce. And maybe all the individuals that survive maybe are not too well adapted to their environment, but they were lucky enough to survive, so they get to reproduce. And the final mechanism was polyploidy, which if you remember was in reference to how many chromosomes you have. And in animals, we don't really see polyploidy very much, except for a few few exceptions. Um, and often when we talk about the number of chromosomes that organisms are supposed to have, we'll say that they are haploid in their gametes and diploid in their somatic cells. And what would be the advantage of having extra chromosomes? So being polyploidy would mean that you could have more adaptations. You could have bigger or stronger. In the case of the fruit, you could make more bigger fruit, which means you can spread your seeds better. And so it does play an advantage because remember, everything about evolution is giving an advantage to survive and then reproduce. Now, if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe and make sure your notifications are turned on so that you can get the newest videos every Tuesday and Thursday. And I will see you all again soon. Bye.